Good afternoon to Dr. Agarwal and uh, Dean uh, Chance Glenn, to our faculty, our staff, our students. Uh, it is uh, certainly a pleasure and a delight for me to bring you greetings on behalf of Alabama a University. We are extremely proud of the achievements and contributions that we have made and continue to make in the area of science particularly in physics here at this great university. I'm pleased that our physics program is one of the major producers, the major producers of minority physics, physics uh, professionals in this nation. Over the years, we have been actively involved in cutting edge research. And we've done that through partnerships with agencies such as NASA and Redstone and companies such as Oak Ridge and Raytheon. But we see our role as not simply limited to that of the delivery of instruction and research on the campus, but also providing venues for provocative discussions and presentations of relevant topics and subjects that are of interest not only to scientists, but also of interest to the general public. One such venue of particular note is this particular lecture series that's named for one of our former professors here at the university the Venkates Hualu Lecture Series. For 15 years, that's a decade and a half, Alabama a and University has had a Nobel Laureate come to this campus. The only university in the nation, the only university in the nation to have had 15 consecutive Nobel laureates on our campus. That, I think, deserves a round of applause. This is certainly a tribute and a testament to our distinguished faculty and our researchers here. So therefore, it is my pleasure on behalf of our Board of Trustees, our dedicated, excellent, committed faculty and staff, the first lady of this university who is with us here uh, today, and the best students that exist anywhere in this nation, the students of Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical University, to welcome you here today. We are eager to hear the lecture of our noted Nobel laureate, Dr. Walter Cohn. Welcome, sir, to the Hill. Welcome to Alabama A&M University. Again, it is our delight and our pleasure to have you here. And we are certain that you will enjoy the informative lecture given by Dr. Cohen. Thank you. Dr. Hugeni, thank you. Uh, to the rest of the faculty, Dr. Uh, Daniel Wims, our provost, thank you as well. And Dr. Agarwal, Thank you for this time. It, it's my honor to provide to you the uh, purpose and occasion for this particular uh, meeting that we have today. We're holding this uh, annual lecture series to honor the contributions of the late Professor Pincha Ventisquarly to the physics department at the Alabama A&M University. This is the 15th annual lecture in that series. In the last 14 years, other four, 14 other Nobel laureates have given this annual lecture. Professor Vint Kaswali obtained his PhD in physics from the Vinares Hindu University under the guidance of Professor, Professor Asandi, a leading uh, uh, spectroscopist of this time. He went on to perform postdoctoral research in various reputable institutions around the world. He worked with three Nobel laureates, Professor Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, Professor Gerhard Hertzberg at NRC, Ottawa, and Professor R.S. Milliken at the University of Chicago. In India, he worked at the Alargi Muslim University and Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. At IIT, 
Kampor, he held, also held the position of the director of the institute. In both institutions, he was responsible in setting up world-class research and teaching laboratories. He supervised the dissertation work of over 50 PhD students and several master's students. Professor Vint Kaswarli supervised the first PhD student from Alabama A&M University, and now he is employed, that student is employed by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. He was the advisor of the very first black female physics PhD recipient in Alabama, now employed at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He published over 200 research papers in refereed international journals. And this is why this particular event is associated with his great accomplishments. He had joined Alabama A&M University in 1982 as a professor in physics. He initiated the experimental research in optics at Alabama A&M, and the physics department flourished during his tenure. He attracted about $4 million research dollars in research funding. He was instrumental in setting up world-class facilities for optics and laser research here. During his tenure at the university, about 10 students obtained their PhDs and 11 students completed their MS degrees. Professor Vinkaswarlu passed away on August 8, 1997 after sudden illness. Even the night of his death, he worked in the department until the end of the day. The Alabama A&M University administration, with the support of our sponsors, is proud to have this annual lecture series and welcome the 15th Nobel Laureate to our beautiful campus. So with that, I want to say thank you, and Dr. Cohn, thank you for being here. Some of you may know me, and some of you may not know me. I am Ravi Lal. I retired from a and about four years ago, and I'm now the Emeritus Professor of Physics. And I, ladies and gentlemen, I have a distinct honor and privilege of introducing the 15th speaker for the Pucha Venkateshwarlu Annual Memorial Lecture Series. Our speaker this afternoon is an Austrian-born American theoretical physicist. He moved to England as a part of the famous Kinder Transport Rescue Operation immediately after the annexation of Austria. As a 17-year-old, he traveled as a part of a British convoy and arrived in Quebec City in Canada. He later entered the University of Toronto and received his BA and MA degrees in Applied Mathematics in 1945 and 46, respectively. Later, he joined the Harvard University and obtained his PhD degree in physics. So you can see that he went from mathematics to physics, which are pretty well connected. Degree in physics from Harvard University in 1948. So 45, 46, 48. Three years, three degrees. This is wonderful. <laughs> and his PhD was under the Julian Schwinger on three-body scattering problem. And later on, when he was at Harvard, he fell under the influence of Professor Van Black, who was also a Nobel laureate later, and subject of the solid state physics. He moved from Harvard to Carnegie Mellon University from 1950 to 1960 after a short stint in Copenhagen as a Nature Research Council postdoc, postdoctoral fellow. His association with the Bell Lab when he was at Carnegie Mellon got him involved with semiconductor physics. So in that process, he was moving from mathematics to physics to semiconductor physics. With association with Luttinger, got him the development of the luttinger con model of semiconductor band structure, which is still well known at this time. In 1960, 
He moved to the newly founded University of California, San Diego as a chair of the Department of Physics. In 1979, he was appointed as the founding director of the Institute of Theoretical Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and later as a professor of physics. Currently, he is a professor emeritus and research professor at Santa Barbara. He made significant contributions to the semiconductor physics, which led to his award of the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society. He was also awarded the Feenberg Medal for his contribution to the many body problem. In 2004, a study of all citations of the Physical Review Journal from 1893 to 2003 found Walter Kahn to be an author of five of the hundred papers with the highest citation impact, including the first two. He was awarded Australian Decoration of Science and Art in 1999 and the Harvard University awarded him as an honorary Doctor of Science in May of 2012. He is very conscious and very modest towards his colleagues and friends and his students. And I quote one of the comments by the speaker, and I quote here, I enormously enjoy the continuing progress made by my younger density functional theory colleagues and my own collaboration with some of them. Looking back, I feel very fortunate to have had a small part in the great drama of scientific progress. And most thankful to all those, including family, kindly acting parents, and he will tell you later, maybe or not, that he had many places where he went in Canada or other places, he found some families who sort of treated him like a family and he stayed with them. And parents, teachers, colleagues, students, and collaborators of all ages who made it possible. End of the quote. To top all these honors and awards, our speaker was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And that's a good question to ask at the end of the lecture that how we from mathematics to physics to chemistry, <laughs> he ended up in that. In 1998, along with John Popel, for the development of the density functional theory, which is a workhorse in the area of material science right now. Please give a warm welcome to our speaker for this afternoon, Professor Walter Cohn, the 15th Nobel Laureate for Pucha Venkata Shirdu Memorial Lecture Series, at Alabama Agriculture and Mechanical University. Dr. Cole. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Okay. So I've, I've heard uh, the names of my predecessors at this lectern. Uh, many of them are good friends of mine. Uh, and I'm very happy that I have this opportunity to follow them and I trust to be followed by others. Uh, this seems like a wonderful idea to me to have this Nobel laureate uh, lecture. Sometimes uh, in smaller institutions, and this is not a very huge institution, uh, one is not quite certain. Are we really talking about the important things, or is it beside the point, or what? And uh, having uh, a large number, 15 or so, uh, Nobel laureates, uh, to have listened to, uh, it, uh, it keeps you sort of at a certain pretty high level of uh, quality. And it shows 
that you have self-confidence to work at this highest level and uh, the plan to continue doing this. Because I understand this is a series that is funded uh, over a long period of time. So thank you all, particularly those who have been directly involved with arranging my uh, visit. Uh, my two colleagues who are sitting near the lectern in front, and they've both made remarks to you. I thank them for their remarks, and I thank uh, the president, the dean, and the others who have given me a very interesting experience already earlier today. So I tried to cast a rather uh, wide net in choosing the title for my call. Uh, density functional theory that almost nobody has heard of. It's a very strange title. Uh, and then for novices and experts. Now, I, if I had listened to uh, election propaganda a little longer, I would have probably said, for novices, the middle class <laughs> and experts. <laughs> uh, so middle class don't feel excluded. <laughs> uh, now, uh, about half of this is based on my Nobel lecture. Uh, it's been uh, popular with readers. I was told it has the number of uh, reprint requests. So I go back to the time of reprints that are almost <laughs> unknown now. Uh, was uh, number one among uh, Nobel lectures. So it was popular. Uh, then uh, the second part is uh, this Nobel lecture is dated 1999. It was actually given in 1998. And uh, uh, the second part is uh, more recent material. Um, now I'll come to I'll give a few pictures here, and I hope you enjoy them. We have a surprise that you don't get at many lectures, so I can't tell you until it happens. Uh, and uh, I'll get started. There is a very famous equation famous in both physics and chemistry. And it's due to a man with a pretty unpronounceable name, Schrodinger. Uh, S-C-H-R, umlaut, O, D-I-N-G-E-R, Schrodinger. Well, that was published, I think, in 25 or 26. I was about two years old. Uh, and uh, it made a huge impact. Uh, one of the great physicists of the last century, or of any century, a man by the name of Dirac, said, this is incredibly important. This equation governs all of chemistry. Strong statement. He modified it. He said, unfortunately, nobody can solve it. <laughs> uh, so it's nice to know that it governs all of chemistry. Well, it's a bit of a dis disappointment that nobody can solve it. Uh, the, uh, he, I would say exaggerated, uh, or at least I think it needs to be interpreted in a particular way. Uh, Dirac, uh, I studied quantum mechanics from his books, wonderful book, and uh, I met him briefly 
was some anniversary in Paris. Um, and, and I know something about uh, what he means by solving an equation. And that was to solve it explicitly. Like, you know, the way you solve a quadratic equation. There's a formula, one line, and that gives the answer. You just plug in the variables and you get the answer. Well, some years later, the computer revolution started rolling around. And many of those equations, or this equation applied to many problems, became soluble with computers. And yet, the Iraq had a deep understanding, one of the deepest of, among his contemporaries. And it was something that the computer revolution has not changed. And so I want to give you a little bit of historical background. Remember the name of this unpronounceable equation? I'll show, show it to you a little later in my lecture. It looks pretty harmless, but I'll try to convince you that the Iraq, in some deep sense, was right. Uh, the Iraq introduced a concept uh, of a magnitude that is impossible, really, to beat. It's one equation uh, the, he talked about one equation, the Schrodinger equation, which you can write down in about 30 seconds. And as he said, all of chemistry has to be consistent with it. Even if you are dealing with a system of almost inconceivably many atoms that interact with each other, number of electrons perhaps uh, 10 to the 10, they're all interacting with each other. They're all pushing each other around. How can that be handled? Or can it be handled? And uh, so the lady who is doing my slides, uh, can you find the one that says the DNA molecule it's, uh, I can tell you the number, the page number. And let's start with that. That's going, but it's, it's on. Uh, all right, let's uh, change the style now. And I'll begin to show you where density functional theory has had a big impact on chemistry and physics, and material science. I understand that's a big subject here in Hansero. Uh, OK, so I have this noted here as page two. OK, so this is a sort of medium-sized molecule, it's a molecule inside another molecule. In here, we have methanol, one, two, three, four, something under 10 atoms. Each of the atoms, just very roughly, uh, has perhaps between five and 10 electrons. And uh, so we're talking about a, on the inside, 
something like 50 electrons altogether. And if you take all the atoms, all the surrounding atoms, we're talking about several hundred atoms, several thousand electrons. Everything pushes everything else in a idiosyncratic way. Uh, can one solve a single equation that will describe all this? That was a challenge that became too much for physics soon after the beginning of quantum physics. The smallest molecule was described by this famous Schrodinger equation very successfully. That's an equation for the hydrogen molecule, two protons, those are the nuclei, and two electrons. People could f solve that fine, compare it with experiment. It was a delight. It was perfect. But you had only two electrons. And here, what you're looking at now, is something more like a thousand electrons. And that just wasn't possible. That's what Dirac, I'm sure, had in mind. Uh, most people here in this room will have solved differential equations, usually fairly simple ones, because they get rapidly, very untractable. A differential equation in one dimension is a so-called ordinary differential equation. In two dimensions, for which you need for even the smallest molecules, it's already two dimensions. For a modest-sized system like your gazing at here, it's an, equ it's, thank you. it's an equation in, as I said, a hundred or several hundred variables. And nobody has been able, in general, to solve anything like that. So the difficulty of solving and understanding theoretically molecules and solids and liquids rises exponentially. Now people use that phrase often when it's really not appropriate. Here it's appropriate. The time taken to do the theory for a molecule of capital N with capital N electrons does rise exponentially in N. And with the traditional theoretical uh, tools at the time, the maximum n number of atoms was somewhere between 10 and 20. And you, even today, with traditional methods, you can't go much further. You can go considerably further. But you still can't even dream to do something like the DNA molecule. And in uh, my Nobel lecture and my, and my publications at that time, I call this an exponential wall. You know, scientists are often pictured as being desperate. They've reached a barrier. They can't go over it, they can't go through it, they're stuck. And uh, I call this an exponential barrier because it rises in height exponentially in the number of atoms. I'll show you uh, and discuss briefly this example. I've already oriented you a little bit, how many atoms there are and how many electrons. And this calculation that is diagrammed in front of you 
that was done with density functional theory. And that couldn't be done before density functional theory was proposed. It simply would take longer than the age of the universe to solve the Schrodinger equation for something that's, well, a little bit complicated, but still very far from DNA. Okay, here's another molecule calculated with density functional theory. The uh, chemical formula is written here. Strontium-8, gallium-16, germanium-30. So it has 30, 46, and 854 atoms. And again, just crudely, each atom has something on the order of 10 or 20 electrons. So we're talking about something pushing 1,000 electrons. And this today is easily managed with density functional theory. So from uh, a practical point of view, that's one of the real contributions to uh, the field of molecules. That's one of the borderline fields between physics and chemistry. And uh, if somebody asks you, well, what is this density functional theory? I usually say, if I'm talking with novices, oh, that's very easy to explain. You just, uh, it gives you a tool to study systems with up to a thousand electrons, where previously your limit was more like 20 or 30. Uh, from a mathematical standpoint, it was an interesting experience to develop this theory and to see the reaction to it. So I'll t tell you a little bit, I'll try and put you uh, into the time when uh, we published two papers on density functional theory. Uh, the uh, chemistry establishment uh, felt, I wouldn't say hostile to it, I would say uh, they smiled. They said, well, we've seen some of Cohn's work and it's been okay, but he has gone berserk. It, it's absurd what he's saying, it's absolutely impossible. And they would invite me, they, there's a, a society, it continues to exist, of um, molecular theorists, and they have a big annual meeting. They invited me once they started every year. I was not a member, I became a member. Uh, and um, uh, they said, well, uh, update us, anything new happening in density functional theory. And uh, I said, well, I'll show you what I think is going on. And they just smiled. There were usually no questions or anything. It just, uh, well, we can't take the time to figure out what is doing wrong, but it's obviously impossible. That lasted about, uh, so from the middle 60s until the middle 90s, 30 years. So uh, science sometimes moves fairly slowly. Uh, it's a long story. The chairman or president of this society was, uh, and the most respected member, was uh, Professor Popo. Uh, some of you may have used his excellent programs for molecular calculations. Uh, and 
Uh, we remained very good friends, and we just sort of felt, well, we're not going to agree on anything here, so there's no point arguing about it. So for 30 years, we remained good friends, and he knew that some had done something terribly wrong, and I knew, no, I hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, and finally, the last time I heard him give a plenary lecture, the title was, um, What are the requirements on a, an acceptable theory of theoretical chemistry? And uh, I was there, very nice place, on the Riviera, uh, in a place called Monton. And he started, uh, showed his first slide, labels number one, and uh, he had won the first criteria, and he said, okay, let's check this new theory, which seems to become popular in certain quarters. Does it satisfy this criteria? So it took him about three minutes to demonstrate absolutely not. Uh, then he went to the second, then to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and he concluded it doesn't satisfy any of those ten criteria. Uh, so he felt he'd done his job. Uh, it was, however, already a little unclear what was going on because the society, every three years, gives a prize to the young person that they felt did the most interesting work in theoretical chemistry over the last three years. And they gave it to a young man, Wang, for his work in density functional theory. And uh, John Popel, as I said, and I were already very good friends. Uh, he invited me to join a small dinner party. And uh, we had a nice conversation, including the young man who just won this three triannual prize for his work in density functional theory. Beautiful, sitting outdoors lemon trees, surrounded by lemon trees. Very romantic. And then a, an elderly, very elegant lady arrived. I didn't know who she was. Later I found out she was the secretary of that society and a very highly reputed traditional quantum chemist. And she handed me an envelope no, it did not contain a check, but it contained a letter informing me that the society decided to uh, name me as a new member of the society. So I had on the one hand this written indication of legitimacy while I just heard a one half hour presentation that proved by means of 10 criteria that I was completely off the track. Uh, okay. Uh, a few years later, pressure was building up among the theoretical chemistry world that they were interested more and more and more complicated molecules like the ones that I showed you, let alone DNA. Uh, and they noticed that traditional Schrodinger equation theory absolutely couldn't handle it. But density functional theory <coughs> could. Not with an accuracy of uh, that quantum chemists sometimes just because they have a good program and they want to see what's the highest accuracy they can get, 
even if they don't need it. Uh, but it, at the accuracy level that laboratory <coughs> chemists need it. Density functions, they did give it. So let me try and ask the lady there to show me a few successive slides and I'll stop you when you come to the Schrodinger equation. So let's go to page six, please. Pardon, is it that? Okay. Well, you see the first equation, it's a very complicated equation, definitely not for novices, but it's a partial differential equation, and no existing, uh, previously existing mathematical program could possibly handle it. And density functional theory could handle it with sufficient accuracy. Not with the kind of accuracy that chemists sometimes just for the fun of it, uh, mathematical chemists would do, would use for the very small molecules, but nobody needed that. So density functional theory became more and more popular. Uh, Professor Popo, uh, soon after the, the meeting that I described to you earlier, asked for permission to incorporate it in his own commercial programs. And I could see that there was a change beginning to happen. Uh, <clears throat> that was in 1992, I think. So in 1998, John Popo and myself found ourselves on the same platform uh, sharing the Nobel Prize. Uh, and I think the barrier to the acceptance of density functional theory had uh, been overcome. So that's a brief history of density functional theory. It's not a very old history. It started with our two papers. They were specifically cited uh, in the Nobel Prize in 65, and it ended about 30 or 40 years later. Sometimes uh, science moves slowly. Sometimes it moves very fast. If you just look at a, at a list of Nobel Prizes, you find that sometimes the Nobel Prize is awarded one or two years after the publication. And I think I'm pretty much of a record holder in uh, 35 years. In any case, that's a little bit of uh, uh, historical uh, storytelling. Uh, now let me be a little more systematic and show you a few more slides. But remember, There'll be nothing as good as my musical presentation. At the very end, there'll be another high point without music. Density functional theory is used somewhere between 90 and 99% of the time for equilibrium systems. Uh, but uh, a few years after our paper, 
there were two German scientists, uh, Gross and um, Runge, R-U-N-G-E, who extended it into time varying systems, so reactions, for example, chemical reactions. Of course, that's a very important part of chemistry. In principle, well now, also, uh, able to be theoretically described. That's a long time ago now also. And uh, Gross, who had been one of my best postdocs, uh, was the senior partner of this work and is, continues to be the leader in this area of time-dependent density functional theory. Uh, it's very important. It enabled the original density functional theory, which dealt mostly with the lowest energy states of chemical systems. It could, in principle, be extended to excited states. In practice, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. Um, And let me show you a few, in addition to these few molecules that I've showed you, and of course, also, let's go to the, uh, to the next slide, please. We've already seen that. That's the princess uh, making her pirouette. Uh, this is the first time in history that she has danced with music. Uh, next, please. And now you see T. T means time in physics. And here is a partial differential equation uh, in yellow. And there is a connection with the total density, electronic density, viewed as a function of position. And if the time is involved, that's the last line on this slide, if the time is involved, the density n is a function not only of position, but varies with time. And so this becomes just mathematically a much more difficult ballgame. Um, density functional theory for static systems has now a very high accuracy. Uh, about 20 years later, I introduced a new concept uh, which I called near sightedness. All of you persons in the audience with, that are nearsighted is the first to you. But even the electrons in molecules are nearsighted in a certain sense. They react primarily to other nuclei, other electrons, near the electron that you're interested in. Now Linus Pauling, great chemist, understood this. He wrote this unmatched book called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. And the chemical bonds, the most important chemical bonds, the so-called covalent bonds, they are bonds involving electrons near each other. There are other chemical interactions, particularly the so-called Van der Waals interactions, that are very weak, 
but they provide an interaction between electrons even far apart. But chemistry, they are not that important in the laboratory, there are exceptions, but chemistry by and large, the, the basic characteristic of uh, chemical uh, bonds you find in so-called covalent bonds near, with, between electrons near each other. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to just um, say a few more words about our original second paper, which was written with a Chinese postdoc by the name of Sham. It reduced, it was some kind of trick. It reduced this partial differential equation uh, whose dimensionality as a mathematical equation was three times the number of electrons. And even for these relatively small molecules became quite unmanageable. It reformulated these equations so that they were equations for functions of only each one of which was a function of only three variables. And there's a huge difference between, let's say you have 10 electrons, solving 10 equations, each in three variables, or trying to solve one equation in 30 variables. 10 equations in three variables, no problem. One equation in 30 variables, impossible. Uh, this um, required certain approximations. Uh, we started this in our original paper, and uh, this goes back now uh, close to 40 years. Uh, and in the meantime, a huge amount of effort, some of it very good, has been Ex expended on making these equations as effective as possible. For large molecules, they are really the only way you can get theoretical insight into molecular behavior. Not only static, but also reaction. And uh, can I have um, page nine or slide nine, please? It is up there. It's up there. So you see there are these functions phi, each little phi, each of them is for one electron it's in three variables. And if you have any electrons, you have, well, for example, 10, then you have 10 such simultaneous equations. But that's manageable. And you see here the kind of mathematics that has been developed for this. And that brings me to my last slide. Nobody understands why it can be so accurate. And that has been checked with thousands of compounds. There are a few exceptions, but that's the typical accuracy, plus or minus 1%. The next item below A is the capital B. That has to do with vibration frequencies or compressibility, and you see suddenly 
you get to a much lower accuracy, it's a whole order of magnitude lower, 10%, 40%, 20%. Uh, I've tried to find the explanation of the symbol EC in the paper where I found this, but I couldn't find the definition, I can't give it to you. I don't know what it is. Uh, the next one I can tell you, in an insulator, uh, those of you who know a little about semiconductor physics will know the importance of so-called energy gap. And again, the errors get to be quite large, 50%. But this A, this universally accurate thing, is with virtually no exceptions near 1%. And chemical structure, the theory of chemical structure, is today completely conducted in terms of density functional theory. And we know from thousands of examples that it's extremely accurate. So that's the main utility today of structural chemistry. So that's more or less the story I wanted to tell you. And I, maybe you can provide a little music to this. <laughs> can you? <laughs> then we'll, we'll stop on a high note. <laughs>